everyone, and welcome to the Environmental Science and Engineering Podcast channel. In this series, we explore topics related to environmental engineering and environmental sciences. In our previous episodes, we discussed Singapore's advanced water management system and how the city of Mecca handles its water and waste challenges, especially during the Hajj season. Today, we'll focus on one of the largest and most fascinating cities in the world, Istanbul. It's not only the most populated city in Turkey, but also a remarkable case study in environmental infrastructure due to its history, geography, and complex urban systems. Once the capital of both the Roman and Ottoman empires, this ancient city is now a massive metropolis of around 15 million people. What makes Istanbul even more unique is its geography. It spans two continents, with one side in Asia and the other in Europe. The city is bordered by the Marmara Sea and the Black Sea, and it's connected by the Bosporus Strait, a critical natural waterway with both strategic and ecological importance. In this episode, we'll explore Istanbul's water supply and wastewater treatment systems, as well as the recent mucilage problem in the Marmara Sea, what causes it, how it spreads, and why it's a growing environmental concern. We'll also discuss major water infrastructure projects like the Melon Water Supply Project, which brings drinking water from outside the city, along with Istanbul's reservoirs, treatment plants, and sustainability strategies. But before we start, don't forget to follow us on Spotify, YouTube, and Instagram. We've grown rapidly, over 4,000 followers on YouTube and Instagram, and more than 300 subscribers on Spotify just in a few months. The fact that most of our listeners stay with us until the very end of each episode truly motivates us. Our guest today is an environmental engineer specializing in urban water management and sustainability in Istanbul. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to discussing Istanbul's environmental infrastructure in detail today. Then let's start with how Istanbul's drinking water is supplied. Providing continuous water service to a city with more than 15 million people sounds like a major challenge. Could you tell us a bit about Istanbul Water and Sewerage Administration, the organization responsible for managing Istanbul's water and wastewater, and how it operates? Of course. The Istanbul Water and Sewerage Administration, known as ISKI, is the main authority responsible for water supply and wastewater management across the city. The institution dates back to 1981 when it was reorganized under its current name. ISKI is financially autonomous, meaning it collects its own revenues and manages its own expenditures. However, it's not completely independent. It operates as an autonomous affiliate of the Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality and remains accountable to the Municipal Council. So where exactly does Istanbul get its water from? Which treatment plants supply the city? And how is water transferred from outside sources? I've often heard about the Melon Project. Could you explain that as well? Istanbul's water comes from a combination of local reservoirs and interbasin transfer systems that bring water from outside regions. Nearly all of the city supply relies on surface water sources, primarily located within the Marmara Basin and the Western Black Sea Basin. Among the local reservoirs, Umerli, Terkos, and Buyuchik Nije are the most important. Beyond these, the largest external systems are the Melon and Yeshil Chai water transfer projects. The Melon system, situated in the Western Black Sea Basin, is one of the most significant engineering projects ever developed to ensure Istanbul's long-term water security, designed to meet the city's demand through 2040, 2050, and even 2071. Water from the Melon Regulator is conveyed to Istanbul via a 189-kilometer transmission line consisting of three massive steel pipelines, each up to three meters in diameter. In addition, the Yeshil Chai system, located near the sakarya Kojehili border, provides supplementary water during periods of high demand. According to 2024 data, Istanbul received approximately 422 million cubic meters of water from Melon and 100 million cubic meters from Yeshil Chai. These amounts vary from year to year. Overall, by 2025, the city supplies about 3.25 million cubic meters of drinking water per day, 
up from 2.63 million cubic meters in 2015, showing how rapidly Istanbul's water demand continues to grow. Does the Melon Project supply water only to the Asian side of Istanbul, or does it also reach the European side? Could you explain a bit more about how the melon system works? Of course. The melon system actually supplies both sides of the city, not just the Asian side. There's a massive pipeline running beneath the Bosphorus that transfers water from one continent to the other. The water taken from the melon regulator is pumped to two major storage reservoirs, then directed to the Jumhuria water treatment plant located near Chekmekoy. One of the main advantages of the system is its flexibility. The transmission line is designed with connections that allow water to be directed toward different reservoirs, such as Yeshilchai, Darlik, or Omerli, depending on the city's needs. After passing through Omerli, the water is treated at Jumhuria plant, stored, and then transported through tunnels and pipelines under the Bosphorus to the Kayitane reservoirs on the European side. So we can say that a significant portion of Istanbul's water actually comes from outside the city's boundaries. What about the treatment process? How do these facilities handle and purify the water? Istanbul's drinking water treatment plants receive raw water either from local dams or long-distance transfer lines and process it through advanced purification systems. On the European side, the main plants are in Bukcek Mece, Kayitane, and Ikiteli. On the Asian side, they include Omerli, Elmali, and Jumhuria. In some areas, multiple plants operate side by side. For instance, Omerli hosts four different treatment facilities located next to each other. The Jumhuria plant treats water transferred from the Melon River and then distributes it to the European side. These facilities mainly use conventional treatment processes, including aeration, coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, and disinfection. Some of the oldest water treatment plants built in 1956, but most of the system expanded significantly after the 1990s, reflecting the city's rapid growth. It sounds like a very complex but well-planned system. What kind of long-term strategies are being recommended to ensure sustainable water management for the future? Experts emphasize that for cities like Istanbul, where water resources are limited, building new dams or pipelines alone isn't enough. Long-term water security depends on integrating rainwater harvesting, gray water reuse, low-flow fixtures, reducing leakage losses, and reusing treated wastewater. If we think back to our Singapore episode, that city successfully diversified its sources with four main national taps, rainwater harvesting, reclaimed water, known as new water, desalination, and imported water from Malaysia. Similarly, Istanbul is expected to move towards a more integrated and sustainable water management model, combining technology, conservation, and resource recovery in the years ahead. That makes perfect sense. Istanbul already has a strong water infrastructure, but in the long run, adopting these sustainable approaches will be absolutely essential. So far, we've talked about how Istanbul's drinking water is supplied and treated, but there's another side of the system, wastewater. In a city of over 15 million people, managing all that wastewater must be a huge challenge. Where does it go and how is it treated? You're absolutely right. Istanbul has a large and complex wastewater network. There are about 90 wastewater treatment plants serving more than 15 million residents. On the Asian side, the main facilities are Tuzla, Pashakoy, and Omerli Chekmekoy. These plants not only treat domestic wastewater, but also play a key role in protecting the Marmara Sea. Most of them use advanced biological treatment, removing organic matter, nitrogen, and phosphorus. But some older facilities still perform only pretreatment and then discharge the water into the sea through deep outfall systems. For example, Kadikoy and Pashabache facilities pretreat wastewater and release it deep under the Bosporus. Istanbul also has one membrane bioreactor plant in Ava, the most advanced type of system currently operating in the city. I've heard that many pre-treatment plants are planned to be upgraded, but it's hard to find space for new infrastructure. You mentioned deep sea discharge. Could you explain that briefly? Sure. Deep sea discharge means releasing treated or pre-treated wastewater into deep marine layers where strong currents can dilute it.
In the Mardra Sea, this is done in the lower layer, where salty water flows toward the Black Sea. The idea is to keep pollution from reaching the surface. However, this method still poses long-term environmental risks, since it can worsen oxygen depletion in deep waters, contributing to problems like mucilage that have affected the Marmara region in recent years. So deep sea discharge helps manage wastewater for now, but improving treatment technology is key to protecting the Marmara and Black Seas in the future. What percentage of Istanbul's wastewater is discharged through deep sea outfalls? Almost all discharges into the Bosporus use deep-sea outfall systems. In total, Istanbul releases about 6 million cubic meters of wastewater per day, and roughly 80% of this goes through deep-sea discharge. Around 1 million meters cubed per day flows into the Marmara Sea, while about 50,000 meters cubed per day reaches the Black Sea. These systems are mostly used by pretreatment plants, which remove solids and oils before pumping the effluent deep below the surface, where strong currents can dilute it. That's a remarkable scale. We'll discuss the mucilage issue shortly, but before that, could you tell us more about the treatment facilities on the European side of Istanbul? Of course. Compared to the Asian side, the European side has an older yet more densely used wastewater network. Most plants here operate at biological or advanced biological treatment levels. The two largest advanced plants are Atakoy, with a capacity of 620,000 meters cubed per day, and Umbarli, treating about 400,000 meters cubed per day. Similar to the Asian side, there are also pre-treatment and deep-sea discharge facilities, mainly in Yenikape and Kuchek Chekmeje. One notable plant is Baltalimani, which used to be a pre-treatment plant but was upgraded in 2024 to a high-rate activated sludge system with anaerobic digesters for energy recovery. However, this process alone doesn't achieve full advanced biological efficiency, especially for nitrogen and phosphorus removal, meaning further improvements will be needed for higher treatment performance. That's fascinating. It really shows how Istanbul is modernizing its old infrastructure while also tackling energy and nutrient recovery challenges at the same time. In our previous section, we talked about Istanbul's water management and the importance of the Marmara Sea in this system. But in recent years, the Marmara has faced a severe environmental disaster that affected everyone, the mucilage crisis. It almost brought the entire marine ecosystem and fishing industry to a halt. Let's dive deeper into this issue. First, what exactly is mucilage and how does it form? Mucilage is a gel-like organic substance that forms through a combination of biological and chemical processes. It's mainly composed of carbohydrates and proteins. However, what made it so dense and widespread in the Marmara Sea wasn't a natural process, it was human-driven pollution. When excessive nutrients, especially nitrogen and phosphorus, enter the marine ecosystem, microorganisms become stressed and begin releasing mucilage. There are three main factors behind this phenomenon. First is global warming, which increases sea surface temperatures. Between 1970 and 2017, sea temperatures along Turkey's coasts rose by about 0.4 degrees Celsius, and the Marmara is already the warmest sea in the country, which encourages phytoplankton overgrowth. Second is stratification, meaning the sea's layers don't mix well. The marmara has a sharp salinity difference between its surface and deep waters, so oxygen doesn't reach deeper zones. This creates a stagnant, low-oxygen environment that accelerates mucilage formation. The third factor is pollution, especially from insufficiently treated wastewater carrying nitrogen and phosphorus. With over 25 million people and heavy industry around the region, the nutrient load entering the Marmara each year is extremely high. Pre-treatment plants like Yenikapi discharge wastewater that still contains large organic loads, fueling algae growth and mucilage production. So it's really a combination of climate change and pollution pressure driving this crisis. But I've also heard that there's an international pollution source, especially from the Danube River. Is its impact on the Marmara really that significant? Unfortunately, yes. 
The Danube River, which flows across Central and Eastern Europe into the Black Sea, carries a substantial amount of pollutants, even though the riparian countries have agreements to control discharges. Because the river is so vast, nutrients and heavy metal loads still accumulate and eventually reach the Black Sea. Through the two-layer flow between the Black Sea and the Marmara, part of this pollution moves southward, affecting the Marmara ecosystem. So, Istanbul's problem isn't just local, it's also transboundary. That makes sense. Mucilage isn't just about how the sea looks. It's a multi-layered crisis that threatens both marine life and public health. Exactly. Mucilage crisis taught us that advanced wastewater treatment, climate action, international cooperation, and public awareness must all work together. Without this integrated approach, it's nearly impossible to restore a semi-enclosed sea like the Marmara. The good news is that experts say the Marmara Sea has self-recovery potential due to its water circulation system. Unlike the Caspian Sea, which we mentioned in another episode and is completely closed, the Marmara exchanges water with the Black Sea and the Aegean. Each year, about 548 cubic meters of water flows from the Black Sea into the Marmara, while 249 cubic meters returns in the opposite direction through deep currents. So, the flow is two-way but unbalanced, making the Marmara twice as vulnerable to pollution coming from the Black Sea than the other way around. So, while the Marmara has the potential to recover within five to ten years, it remains Turkey's most fragile sea, and its protection is crucial for both the Marmara and the Black Sea ecosystems. You've shared some really valuable insights today. We've covered a lot, from Istanbul's water supply and treatment systems to the mucilage problem and its impact on public health. To wrap up, I'd like to ask, what is the future vision for Istanbul and Turkey in terms of water and wastewater management? Where do we stand today and where are we headed? That's an excellent question. In recent years, Turkey has made remarkable progress in wastewater management. Currently, around 90% of the country's wastewater is treated, with over a 1,000 treatment plants operating nationwide. In Istanbul alone, there are about 90 wastewater treatment plants. However, when we look at the level of technology, the picture becomes more nuanced. As of 2025, Istanbul has 13 advanced biological, 62 biological, 7 pre-treatment, 7 package, and only one membrane bioreactor plant. So, while the infrastructure is strong in numbers, advanced technologies are not yet widespread. This brings us to the topic of water reuse. In 2023, Istanbul Water and Sewage Administration recovered about 29.3 million cubic meters of treated wastewater, but that's only 1.8% of the total treated volume. Nationally, the reuse rate is around 5%, while Turkey's goal is to reach 15% by 2030, with a long-term target of 15-20%. to 20%. Additionally, methods like rainwater harvesting and greywater recycling are expected to play a much greater role in future urban water management. In late 2024, Turkey officially introduced the Water Efficiency Regulation, requiring public buildings and industries to integrate these systems. This shift will make urban water cycles far more sustainable in the coming years. So, in summary, Turkey is strong in quantity but still evolving in quality. The next stage will focus on advanced treatment, reuse projects, and integrated management systems. This has been a very comprehensive and insightful discussion. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise. Thank you. I hope this episode helps raise awareness of Istanbul's and Turkey's water future and inspires more people to care about sustainable water use. Absolutely. Sustainable water management is no longer just an engineering challenge. It's everyone's responsibility. For more content like this, don't forget to follow the Environmental Science and Engineering Podcast on Spotify, YouTube, and Instagram.